Good evening, everyone. Welcome to NTD Tonight. I'm David Zhang. Here is a preview of some of today's top stories. Jury selection for Trump's so-called hush money trial is on pause until tomorrow. Only seven jurors have been chosen so far. Another Ivy League University president testifies before Congress. We'll see what she has to say about anti-Semitism on campus. Two Colorado counties sued the state over immigration-related laws. Find out more about the dispute. First up, Trump's so-called hush money trial adjourns till Thursday tomorrow. So far, seven jurors have been chosen, with five more still needed. The judge also plans to select six additional backup jurors. The court was not in session today. Lawyers will go through the next batch of 96 potential jurors tomorrow morning until a panel of 12 New Yorkers and six alternates are selected. Seven jurors took their seats for the historical trial on Tuesday, four men and three women, with jobs ranging from corporate attorney to teacher to software engineer. Mr. President, what kind of juror in your mind is an ideal juror in this trial? Both the prosecution and defense have 10 peremptory strikes to remove a juror from the pool. So far, each side have used the six peremptory strikes, so both have only four strikes left. The judge said the opening statements for the trial could begin as soon as next Monday. Meanwhile, Trump is turning the table on District Attorney Alvin Brack, the prosecutor in his criminal case. Last night, Trump left his own criminal trial and visited Bodega in Lower Manhattan, where in 2022, store clerk Jose Alba stabbed an attacker, then got brought up on murder charges by DA Alvin Bragg's office. The case was eventually dropped, but did put Bragg under a lot of political heat from critics, including Mayor Eric Adams, who viewed the stabbing as a clear self-defense. Trump was invited to the convenience store by the Bodega Association, whose worker said they would like to see positive changes in public safety. Leaders from Columbia University are testifying before Congress on the school's response to anti-Semitism on campus. The university president, Manoush Shafik, says she is committed to confronting anti-Semitism. Start, I've held on to four principles. First, safety is paramount, and we would do whatever is necessary to ensure the safety of our campus. Because of those efforts, the vast majority of our demonstrations have been peaceful. Second, we would demonstrate care and compassion equally to everyone. Third, we must uphold freedom of speech because it's essential to our academic mission, but we cannot and shouldn't tolerate abuse of this privilege to harass and, disc and, and discriminate. And fourth, the ultimate answer to anti anti-Semitism and all its forms is education. Shafiq was originally asked to testify at the House Education Committee hearing in December, but she declined citing scheduling conflicts. And just this morning, pro-Palestinian student protesters gathered on Columbia's campus. The protest fell outside the hours designated under new rules Columbia adopted in February. During today's hearing, committee chairwoman Virginia Fox appeared with the Jewish students from Columbia who said they have faced the threats and physical confrontation. Chairwoman Fox slams Columbia as one of the worst hotbeds of anti-Semitism and hate. Congresswoman Elisa Stefanik said Republicans would hold Columbia accountable for failing to protect students. Four months ago, the same committee heard testimonies from Harvard President Claudine Gay and University of Pennsylvania's President Elizabeth McGill. A chain of events following the hearing ended with the two Ivy League presidents stepping down from their positions. Also on Capitol Hill, the House Oversight Committee held a hearing on the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP's political warfare. Experts highlight how the CCP infiltrates the U.S. in various aspects. Today we're in a new Cold War. Our adversaries wield weapons far beyond the traditional military arsenal, instead harnessing the power of communication to distort and manipulate the very fabric of our society. The relaxation of our security posture concerning active measures conducted by adversaries like China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran has left American institutions, those of its allies, and the entire international order vulnerable to relentless and ongoing political influence campaigns. 
Retired Brigadier General Robert Spaulding said the CCP and its proxies are waging a global political warfare to influence human civilization and that they are using the tools of statecraft, business, economics, trade, academia, and especially technology. He highlighted how Chinese-owned apps like Timo and TikTok harvest user data and how American academia is influenced by Chinese economically. Spalding argued that the U.S. must completely separate the institutions of the free world from CCP influence, or else the republic will slowly disintegrate. The hearing marks the beginning of the Oversight Committee's government-wide investigation into the CCP's warfare. We have more updates on the conflicts in the Middle East. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with the foreign ministers of Germany and the UK in Jerusalem earlier today. Here's Netanyahu. I thank our friends for their support in the defense of Israel, and I say this, both support in words and support in actions. They also have all kinds of suggestions and advice. I appreciate it, but I want to make it clear. We will make our own decisions, and the state of Israel will do everything necessary to defend itself. During the meeting, German and UK foreign ministers both urged the restraint. World leaders are urging Israel not to retaliate after Iran launched an aerial attack over the weekend. UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron stressed the need to refocus discussions on the Israel-Hamas war. Back to hostages and humanitarian aid, he also called for G7 sanctions on Iran. And back in the U.S., the Biden administration said they will also impose sanctions on Iran. They said the new sanctions will target Iran's missile and drone program and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard in the coming days. This came as the House passed the second batch of measures to combat the Iranian threat. It includes eight bills and two resolutions. Local leaders in Southern California are calling for more border security as more illegal immigrants keep crossing and overwhelming communities. This comes as illegal boat landings were spotted dropping them off. San Diego County leaders on Monday held a press conference to call on the state and federal government to secure the border and beaches. This comes as more illegal boat landings are spotted on San Diego beaches. The most recent occurrence was in Carlsbad last Saturday. The kids in the water, people sunbathers, and the boat pulled up high speed with zero regard to safety. We don't know if these men were simply migrants or whether they were just looking for a better life or if they were on terrorist watch lists or if they were human traffickers or if they were smuggling drugs or weapons. About approximately 10 people hopped out of the boat, ran into the Carlsbad neighborhoods and were picked up by an SUV and driven away. It was a very coordinated effort. We have no idea who they are. We have no idea where they are. And these people were not vetted at all. According to Desmond, since 2020, there has been a 139 percent increase in maritime human smuggling events like the recent Carlsbad incident. The San Diego border sector saw nearly 7,000 encounters last week, the highest. Since September, San Diego County witnessed over 125,000 illegal immigrants entering the region, with more than 25,000 street releases in just two months. The fact that many people have come here is primarily because we put out the red carpet. And in knowing that once you get here across the border, even if you come illegally, the chances of being deported are very, very little. There, there's no repercussions for entering the country illegally, coming via by boat or just walking across the border. They are calling for an end to sanctuary city policies to strengthen border and community security and urging for more enforcement measures and increased penalties for human smugglers. In California, being a sanctuary state means local law enforcement cannot work with immigration officials. So even if city police arrest people who come in illegally, they cannot turn them over to ICE or Border Patrol. Two counties have sued the state of Colorado over immigration-related legislation. The suit targets two state laws that prevent communication between local and federal governments on immigration matters. NTD's Jason Blair reports. Colorado House Bill 19-1124 and House Bill 23-1100 are the two bills named in the suit that limit local and federal law enforcement communication. 
It is the position of the Board of County Commissioners in this lawsuit that that is a violation of several tenets of the Colorado State Constitution. The laws also ban police from arresting illegal immigrants in the state. The suit was formally filed by the Douglas County Board, the Douglas County Sheriff, the El Paso County Board, and the El Paso County Sheriff. We cooperate with our federal partners, and things like this tell us we can't even cooperate with ICE, who is a federal law enforcement agency. That is absolutely ridiculous. We must allow our law enforcement officers to keep our community safe, to have the tools in their toolbox. Some of the commissioners expressed uncertainty about how many illegal immigrants have been transferred to Douglas or El Paso counties. They did cite at least 40,000 bust from Texas to the Denver area over 16 months. Last week, the city of Denver announced it will spend $89.9 million on services for illegal immigrants. Numerous budget cuts were mentioned to help pay for the program, including an $8.4 million, or about 2%, cut to the Denver police. Jason Blair, NTD News. We'll take a short break now, everybody, but here's a look at what we have for you when we come back. A women's prison in California is set to close. More on the current situation and plans for current inmates. Powerful storms fire up in the Midwest with large hail and tornadoes. We'll take a look at the damage. California officials say want to expand Joshua Tree National Park and create a new California National Monument. Those stories and more are coming up on NTD Tonight. Welcome back to NTD Tonight. I'm your host, David Zhang. A women's prison in California is set to close. Despite attempts to reform the troubled facility after an Associated Press investigation exposed the rampant staff on inmate sexual abuse. NTD's David Lamb reports. Authorities say FC Dublin in California won't close just yet until each inmate's status has been reviewed. Director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons on Monday announced the closure. NTD received a statement from the Bureau saying they've taken unprecedented steps to address culture, recruitment, and employee misconduct. Just 10 days before the closure announcement, a federal judge appointed a special master to oversee the prison. FCI Dublin, about 21 miles east of Oakland, is one of six women-only federal prisons. It currently houses 605 inmates, down from 760 in February 2022. Advocates have called for inmates to be freed from FCI Dublin, which they say also has hazardous mold, asbestos, and inadequate health care. A judge said inmates could be released to another correctional facility, home confinement, or halfway house, or granted a compassionate release, and employees won't lose their jobs. It's unclear whether the inmates or employees will be transferred to another low-security women's prison such as FCI Dublin, but there's been speculation over prison reform. A former correctional officer at a different facility shared his insight on prison developments. One of the changes they did recently, starting in around 2019, was the non-designated program. The integration of inmates that were protective custody you know, the, the rapists, the sex offenders, the, the dropouts, and the general population, your regular gang members, and they mixed them. They made us mix them. So when you mix those individuals, they're going to kill each other. And that's what you're seeing right now at an accelerated rate. According to KQED, U.S. Judge Gonzalez Rogers wrote that she doesn't believe sexual misconduct has been eliminated at the facility, but that the alleged pervasive sexualized environment at the facility today is exaggerated. Last August, eight inmates sued the Bureau, alleging the agency failed to eliminate the sexual abuse. A lawyer said inmates continue to face retaliation for reporting abuse. 
the Bureau said it will try to keep the inmates as close to their release locations and ensure they have access to counsel at their future institutions. David Lamb, NTD News, California. A severe storm system is spinning up tornadoes, unleashing hail and producing destructive wind gusts across portions of the Midwest. NTD's Christina Corona gives an update on the weather. The National Weather Service recorded tornado sightings in at least 10 counties spanning Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri, and Kansas on Tuesday. The severe weather left at least two people injured and triggered dozens of tornado warnings from Kansas through southeastern Iowa. There were multiple reports of strong wind gusts over 60 miles per hour from passing severe thunderstorms across Iowa and Illinois, topped by a gust of 72 miles per hour in Stanwood, Iowa. There are several hot spots, if you will, uh, across the country where severe weather is more likely than others. Of course, we know this uh, in a classical sense to be Tornado Alley from the northern Great Plains to the southern Great Plains. In Dallas County, Iowa, one of the tornadoes carved a path nearly seven miles long, causing damage to several agricultural structures and resulting in minor damage to homes and property. A changing climate is also leading to warmer and wetter nights, which raise the odds for nocturnal tornadoes. So the western Great Plains, western Kansas, western Nebraska, western Oklahoma, they're just running a little bit drier in those spots than maybe previous period of time, and so your precipitation has shifted east a little bit. Well, we've also seen a higher frequency of tornadoes. Though tornadoes can and do occur year-round, late April to the middle of May is when the strongest tornadoes that cause fatalities usually appear. If you're in an area where severe weather is something you've experienced before, um, it can and it will happen again, and so we want you to, this time of the year, start thinking about what do I need to be doing to make sure myself, my family is protected ahead of severe weather. On Wednesday, storms will move eastward and could potentially bring hail, damaging winds and tornadoes, unleashing severe thunderstorms from the Great Lakes and Ohio Valley to Tennessee and Arkansas. Thursday, we'll see another storm sweep from Texas to Ohio. Christina Corona, NTD News. U.S. lawmakers from California introduced the bill to create a national monument in the Southern California desert and to expand the adjacent to Joshua Tree National Park. NTD's Christina Corona has more on the story. Representative Raul Ruiz and Senator Alex Padilla have proposed a bill aiming to establish the Chukwala National Monument and broaden the boundaries of Joshua Tree National Park. The legislation seeks to safeguard areas spanning Riverside and Imperial Counties, which include segments of the Chukwala Valley, the entire Chukwala Mountains, and the neighboring Mecca Hills. They signed a letter urging President Joe Biden to utilize his authority granted by the Antiquities Act of 1906 to officially designate the monument across eastern Imperial and Riverside counties. The National Nonprofit Center for Biological Diversity stated, These landscapes are rich in biological diversity and home to desert tortoises, kit foxes, golden eagles, and the proposed monument's namesake, Chukwala lizards. They go on to say the bills are supported by local tribes, numerous businesses, communities, and conservation groups. The proposed law would establish a new national monument spanning over 600,000 acres in the Southern California desert and add over 17,000 acres to Joshua Tree National Park. Joshua Tree National Park currently has 800,000 acres of terrain. Lawmakers aim to ensure the new bill won't hinder local renewable energy development and say its boundaries are specifically drawn to avoid areas identified under the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan. Christina Corona, NTD News. News from the NBA today as one player announces his retirement from a respected career and another player has cut his career short. Here's NTD's Tyler Castillo with more details. NBA power forward Blake Griffin announces his retirement from the NBA after 14 seasons. Griffin was a first overall selection by the LA Clippers back in 2009, where in his second season he won Rookie of the Year. He also made it to five straight All-Star appearances. He spent eight seasons with the Clippers before being traded to the Pistons after he already signed a five-year extension with the Clippers. He spent a total of four seasons with the Detroit Pistons. 
He was then bought out and then signed for two years with the Brooklyn Nets. His last season was spent with the Boston Celtics during the 2022-2023 season. He finished his career with 765 games played and 14,513 points. During the 2014 season, he finished third in MVP voting behind Kevin Durant and LeBron James, solidifying himself as a top talent in the league throughout the 2010s. Toronto Raptors' John T. Porter has received a lifetime ban from the NBA for gambling violations. An investigation found that Porter disclosed confidential information to bettors, affected his effort in one game while on the Raptors, and placed bets on NBA games while he was playing in the minor league affiliate G League to the NBA. The NBA launched the investigation after the league found irregularities in the final games for the Raptors, where Porter left the games within a few minutes of playing due to illness. The total payouts of these bets resulted in a $76,059 payout with a net winning of $21,965. Porter has finished his career with the NBA with 37 games played and 137 points for two seasons with the Memphis Grizzlies and the Toronto Raptors. Stay tuned for China in Focus with Tiffany Meyer coming up next. President Biden calling to triple tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminum. This as he doubles down on wooing voters in Pennsylvania, a key battleground state. More details coming tonight on China in Focus with Tiffany Meyer at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. And that's all we've got for you tonight. We'd like you to join us again on NTD Tonight every weekday at 9 p.m. I'm David Zhang. Have a wonderful evening.